Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for um, sending these gals here to lead us into worship. Thank you for a new song that you put in our hearts. Thank you for delivering us from being so narcissistic and just caught up on things that, that are beautiful and lovely, but not worthy of our worship and devotion. Lord, we don't even appreciate things that you've given us when they become too important. Idols always bite us. They always take us down. But Lord, when you are first, we can enjoy the blessings you've given us and they don't take over. They only facilitate a beautiful life. Lord, we are called to sanctify the Lord Jesus in our hearts. We are supposed to ever put the Lord before us because you are at our right hand. We shall not be moved. Lord, we know so many times things in our lives are vying for um, not always first place, but to be on the same level as you. And you said, you shall not have any gods before or beside me. Lord, just show us if there's something creeping up in value systems. We're measuring something incorrectly. <clears throat> if our marriages, our children, our churches, our education, our comfort, anything is vying for a position of devotion that is inordinate or not appropriate, you would judge it wrong or sinful. We don't always see it. So we just ask you to show us that. And as we look in your word this morning, we pray that your word would look into us, that we would feel like we were almost at a spa treatment, spiritually speaking. You just really work into us like massage oils or just a fragrance of your truth and work out things that are, that are tied up or are wrong. I thank you, Lord, that when you bought us with your blood, you made a commitment to love us as we were and take us where you know we can be. We have no other love like that. So Lord, bless this time by your Holy Spirit. Lead and guide us into truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, last night we learned about um, the Holy Spirit's power to help us get things done. We learned that we should see God's work through, um, through we should see it through based on his measurements. That even if we have the right foundation, we receive Christ, we know we are sinners, we know he died for us, we know he rose from the dead. We're going to heaven based on what he did. He now wants to build us up, and that's where the measurements of God come in. The measurements of God, if we do things according to a standard, that's not what gets us into heaven. There's only one work that gets us into heaven, is the work of Jesus Christ upon that cross. But once he did that, he, he kind of like, is like an HGTV person. You know, he buys us sight unseen, takes everything inside, and says, I'm going, you are mine, and I'm going to rebuild you. I'm going to make you into something beautiful, and the world's going to see how real I am, and you're going to know the potential that I have for you. I think that is so special of the Lord. I love those home shows, you know, because especially when they, they don't know what it is, they buy it at an auction. And then they open the door and there's cockroaches and dead rats and, you know, ugh. And then all of a sudden it's this beautiful, you know, place that people are paying top dollar for. And, and I always say, that's me, that's me. I'm the rat infested house. And God's taken over my life and knocks down this wall and rewires my head so I think correctly and, um, you know, gives me open concept. <laughs> like, where I'm not hiding everything in my life, you know. It's so great that God does that. But we know that we'll only be built the way God wants to build us if we understand that the plumb line is the eyes of the Lord. Um, we must never trust our own measurements. Proverbs 26.12. Proverbs 26.12 says, <clears throat> Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. So we see here that if there's somebody that just is so, I'm going to tell you that there's a big difference between confidence and arrogance. And we often mistake those. And the world kind of preaches confidence, but I think they're preaching arrogance. Because God loves people to be confident. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning, is strong confidence. You know, there's a way to be confident. I always tell everybody it's a big difference from having your head up versus your nose up. <laughs> this is confidence, this is arrogance. And so we can be deceived. And we think we're being confident or 
but we are being arrogant. The problem with arrogance is arrogance blinds us to arrogance. It's one of the worst things we can deal with in our lives because if you're arrogant, you don't think you are, and you can't see that you are. It says there, if you see a man who's wise in his own eyes, there's more hope for a fool than for him. We are unreasonable when we are confident in our own perspectives. One of the best phrases for your marriage, for your friendships, for your work relationships, is to learn to say, I may be wrong. Or you know what, you may be right. That's not saying I am right, you are wrong. It's you may be right, I may be wrong. Talk about inviting the Holy Spirit into a conversation. You know, he gives grace to the humble, doesn't he? But he resists the proud. You can never resolve that problem at work when everybody's contentious and believes they know that it should be done a certain way. If everybody says, well, you know what, I may be wrong. Or you know what, you may, how many of us have been staunch about something? Because we just know. And then it's smack. We find out we absolutely had it wrong. You know, in humble pie, it tastes good. <laughs> it's, like, it's very good for you. You know, but you know, you, you, you get the facts, you know, and you go, oh. Or I think texting has humbled us all. Because now, when you go, no, I didn't say that. Yes, I did. Scroll back. <gasps> They did say that. You know, before you had to try to remember what you said, and you always remember according to your own favor. So um, when it's objective, you know, I go, oh, John, you did say to me at two. I read, you know, three or whatever, and I'm sorry, honey. And it's good to know. It says if you see someone who's wise in their own eyes, it's worse than just having a fool. And you won't be able to discuss things in wisdom. You won't come to the right measurements about life and decisions and raising your children. How many of us have punished our children before we got all the facts? And then we found out and you just, you, you resign, right? You write the letter, pack up your suitcase, I'm not gonna be a mom anymore, because you feel so bad that you handed out a punishment without having all the facts. Or, or somebody got fired, or something happened because people were stubborn and high-minded, and they, didn't, they trusted their own measurement of a person, of a situation. I know God wants us to be thinkers, and I know he wants us to assess and observe, but we can never do it being wise in our own eyes. We all have to have humility in judgment, meaning we are allowed to make judgment, especially those of you who are administrators, managers, moms, any kind of authority that you have, you have to rule in humility because there's probably something you're missing, and you have to be able to say, well, I haven't heard it all the way through yet. This will clothe a woman in wisdom. It'll make us shine like, like the world doesn't even know what it is because the world doesn't operate with humility and judgment. Whoever yells the loudest, whoever has the microphone, whoever has the network, they're the ones that are right. <laughs> but we learn that we have to be humble in our judgment. In Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, it says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And that woe is like, um, like a judgment, like something bad's gonna happen to you. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, verse 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. We live in kind of the day of judges again, where every man does what is right in his own eyes. And you, there's no, there's, nobody thinks there is a plumb line for anything anymore. There is no measurement. It's always up to, you can be wise in your own eyes, the way you wanna look at yourself, the way you wanna judge something. We live in a very, this Isaiah time. <laughs> it's the way that it is. Um, my son is a political commentator, is an interesting person. He loves the Lord and everything, but he has an interesting mission. Some of you might know who he is, but his name is Elijah Schaefer, and he runs a YouTube channel called Slightly Offensive. And he has huge followings, and he's been on Fox News, and he's speaking at the University of Kansas today, I think, or last night. He spoke, it goes all over the country. He's a, um, he's a conservative millennial, which is, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but <laughs> he's a conservative millennial. And he uses Socratic uh, methods of debate to show if people judge things by their own opinions, uh, a society cannot prolifer proliferate. There has to be objective measurements for things. He's trying to help kids understand they can't just say, 
I think I'm a girl, I think I'm a boy, I think I'm this, I think I'm that. He's trying to move them towards plumb lines to measure things. And he's very kind, he's not argumentative. He's been hurt, he's been beat up, he's been, you can always research him, he's an interesting fellow. I love him, I'm glad I'm not called into that arena. I'll teach the Bible, thank you. But um, the plumb line is gone, and that's why it's hard. And what he's trying to do is help kids, he goes to college campuses and says there has to be a measurement. We don't build houses the way you guys are building your own lives. We don't go, I just think that I should be able to stick a knife into the electric socket and it shouldn't hurt me. Well, it still will because that's the law and the physics behind electricity. So he's trying to let people know there is a plumb line. There are standards. Whether you want to believe in the God who made those standards, that's on you. But the standards are there and they're woven into society. And that's why it's woe to us when we do the opposite. Meaning life is not going to go well for us. God gives us the freedom to make our own choices. But when we choose against his standards, things are not built up to code. And we're actually being those foolish women who tear down our house with our own hands by saying, I think. Well, I, you know, I personally as a believer, it's very important for me to really avoid words like I think, or you know what I think, or in my opinion. Oftentimes, I don't use those phrases. I like to say, it is written, or will the scriptures say? Now, there are other things that are just opinion, right? Like, in my opinion, you know, I don't like Starbucks coffee. I just don't. I'm sorry, don't shoot me. I just don't. <laughs> but those obviously flavors and what you like, cat versus dog, Pepsi versus Coke, those are fine to have opinions. We're people and we have opinions. But when it comes to measuring things, especially righteousness and standards and the way things should be done. As believers, we should be people who say, I, let me see what the scripture says. Let me pray about that. Don't you think we'd all build our lives and help us help build other people's lives by saying those things more often than I think? Or, you know, if you go to a hair salon, those are always interesting places. I always say, I want to get up and start teaching a Bible study. Because I'm hearing everybody going, you know what I do? And I go, no, like, well, they've never been married to that person's husband. They don't know what they would do. They're just like, ah, ah, ah. We tell these women, you know, I don't know if it's the bleach or that it's making everybody strong. But, you know, everybody's got their opinions in those hair places. And I'm, I'm always going, whoa. You know, I want to get over there and say, don't say that. And the scriptures say, and you're disagreeing with the creator of the universe. And you're feeding into her life a false plumb line. And if she tries to build according to your biased measurement, it's going to be crooked. Her marriage is going to fall. She's going to end up with unnecessary emotional trauma. She might contribute to unhealthy mental health by making those choices. So it's very important that we're not wise in our own eyes for our own lives or when we give advice and counsel to other people. Mamas, be careful how much information and advice you give your kids. Ah, they go crazy with you. <laughs> I'm talking to myself too. But really be slow to speak and quick to listen. And oftentimes as your kids get a little older, it's wise to listen to them and don't say anything except, you know what, can we pray about that right now? It's time to start weaning them to where they look higher than us. And then maybe they'll even come back and say, well, would you like me to tell you what the scriptures say? No, okay. Do you want to pray about that? <laughs> just, you know, just give them time. Then they start thirsting for your, for your advice because they're like, why are you? My kids get mad at me because I don't give them a lot of advice anymore. And they go, Mom, I want your advice. You know, they get all mad. And I say, well, sometimes I sense the Holy Spirit telling me not to. Sometimes I sense the Holy Spirit telling me to just pray for you and support you. But I'm not hiding it. Do you want to know what the scripture says? I'd be glad to give you scripture. Anytime. If you want scripture, I'll send it to you. I go, but I don't really want to build your life. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. I'm your mama. I don't want that kind of responsibility to tell you what school to go to. You know, they'll come to me with these questions like, well, should I get my master's degree in this or this? Like, I want that responsibility. And I go, well, I don't know. What, what's good about this one? What do you want to do? I might ask questions. But I say, I honestly have no idea what you should do. But I know who does. I go, let's go ahead and pray and ask him and see what he wants you to do. We are far too contaminated to trust, to trust our own judgment and our measurements. We've been wounded by sin. We've been fed things through the media. We have our own culture behind us. We have our own opinions. 
we're very contaminated. As far as the plumb line, we have a bias. And until we know we have a bias, we're in a very dangerous place. So it's always good to know I have a bias. Oftentimes when I meet with the Lord in the morning, I write down in my journal. I just say, Lord, I don't trust my judgment. That's why I'm here first thing in the morning. I don't know if I had bad sleep last night and I might make a hasty decision or I don't know if something's gonna come up today that's gonna to overwhelm me and I'm gonna run in the opposite direction. I'm just to run towards my Goliath and not away from it. I need your help. I don't trust my judgment. I'm coming before you saying I need you to guide my day. I could ruin my family's life. I could ruin somebody else. I could ruin my own life. Life is a heavy responsibility. And sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I go, I can't do this without you, Lord. I just can't. Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Whenever we're trusting our own measurements, we are not fearing the Lord. They are mutually exclusive. When we have our ideas, but we're careful, we, we're walking in the fear of the Lord. We have to remember we are on earth and he is God in heaven. And we have lived a very short time, no matter how old we are, in comparison to eternity. If we aren't wise in our own eyes, our lives will be more of what the Lord wants them to be. Romans 12, 16, <clears throat> do not be wise in your own opinion. Is that a suggestion or commandment? It's a commandment. So we have to do it. We have to say, I, I'm not going to be wise in my own opinion. And you know when you are. And I know when I am. Because we get a little, you know, get a little like this. Or we get a little frustrated with people. I go, why did they do that? They should have done that. Okay, as soon as you're talking like that, we are wise in our own opinion. And we have to realize, I, I'm not, to, even when I present my opinion, I shouldn't present it like it's somewhere in Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> it's just my opinion. There are times we can give opinions, but we have to make sure we say it's opinion, and we have to do it not in, in an arrogant way. You know, we say, well, you know, I think maybe you should do this, but whatever you, you decide, that's great for me. You know, give people the freedom to not be controlled by you. <laughs> you know, but you can always share. Don't you love it when a, a sister gives you an opinion and you really like it and it works? I do love that when people do that. But I also like to know that I have the freedom to say no and they're not going to get hurt and post something on Facebook about how I rejected them. You know, I want to have that freedom to, like, go another way if I need to. So we always present opinion with humility. We shouldn't be wise. It's a command, not a suggestion. So every time we are wise in our own opinion, we are breaking that command in, in the book of Romans. Um, the Lord wants us to measure, but he wants us to measure accurately. In the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, John receives visions and instructions from the Lord. Turn to Revelation 11.1. 1. And this is kind of where we have the whole rise conference name, it does match, I forgot, where it says rise and measure. That's where rise comes. It's a cool theme. It does work. Okay, I forgot. So um, in Revelation 11.1, 1, an angel comes to John and speaks to him. And this angel comes to John, John records it, and says, then I was given a reed, like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Interesting command, isn't it? A heavenly measurement, like measuring rod, is given to John, and he says, I want you to go, and I want you to measure three things. I want you to measure the temple, I want you to measure the altar, and I want you to measure the people that are worshiping there. So get off your depth, John, and go and measure. And a command for us to measure. He wasn't supposed to measure any of these things by his own standard. He wasn't to go, oh, I'd say it's about, looks to me, it could be. He was given a standard before he was given the command. And he was given a measurement before he went to measure. Now, John had a heavenly measuring tool. And now John was commanded to measure. I believe we can learn from this command in Revelation. And the Lord wants us to measure the temple, 
the altar and those who worship there. First, the temple of God. What does that mean? Why was he supposed to measure that? Well, the temple of the Lord was commanded to be built. And when the Lord directed the temple to be built, he had exact measurements that that temple had to be built by. In 1 Chronicles 28, 11, it says that David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vegetable, for its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, verse 12. And the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, all the chambers all around, of the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for the dedicated things. Now, I really love this whole thing because it says there that it's, he had the plans by the spirit. David was given the plans. Now, it doesn't really spell it out too well in the Old Testament, but I wish it would have. There's a lot of things like I want to get to heaven and say, okay, this part that you didn't get real detailed on in the scriptures, can I just, can we rewind? Can I look at that? Like, was David playing, you know, his you know, lute or whatever, or his harp, and he started, like, just being tuned with the Spirit and then getting a vision, and how, or was he sitting there with a pen and the Holy Spirit gave him, but by the time Solomon came to build the temple, because David was not allowed to, David had accumulated everything he needed to build, and he had the actual architectural plans to give to his son. And that's a whole other study about we as parents and how we can affect the purposes and callings of our children by having things prepared to hand to them that we are never gonna do. Some of you wanna make a mighty impact for the Lord, but you're doing things and your children are the ones that are gonna build the temple. But that doesn't mean you sit back and go, oh, well. No, you accumulate, you get plans, you hand it down to them, you put it into them. I remember one time when my kids were little, I had four, I had four kids and I homeschooled for many years. And I remember thinking like, oh, I'm just sick of this. <laughs> I love my kids, but you know, I'm going, if I have to fill one more sippy cup and give another spelling test, I'm gonna go crazy. And I'm going, I wanna make a difference, Lord, for the whole kingdom. And, and I remember I was on a hike once and I was praying and the Lord said, how many are there of you? I said, one. He said, how many kids do you have? I said, four. He goes, well, if you pour into those four kids, that's four people making a difference for the kingdom rather than just you. I was so humble. I said, you're right again. <laughs> I'll pour into my kids and see what you do through them. So even with David and Solomon, who David had disqualified himself as a man of war and bloodshed, he couldn't build the temple. But I love David because he didn't pout. I wanted to build a temple. He didn't do that. He said he found out what he couldn't do, and then he found out what he could do. And he was more excited with what God let him do instead of what he wanted to do. This is David is such a cool guy. You're like, oh well, I can't build it, but I could get together all the money, I can get all the workers. Like, and he didn't, he just didn't waste that. He didn't let a disqualification make him quit being used by the Lord. He found out how can I be used by the Lord, even though I know I can't build the temple. So he received these plans by the Spirit. He was given these plans, and I'm wondering if David could focus more on the measurements of the temple because he wasn't building the temple. He could really be exact, because sometimes when you're building, you wanna like hurry up through the measurements and get something done. I'm sure none of you have done that. If you're, <laughs> Oh, I don't want to pay attention. Let's just get this up. You know, let's just do this. Or I want to make a cake and, oh, I don't have to measure it exactly. I'm just want to, mm, you know, afterwards, like, oh, I use salt instead of sugar, or baking powder instead of baking soda. Or, you know, you rush through the measurements and you didn't get the outcome. And so it's neat that God chose David by the Holy Spirit to make the plans because he had the measurements for the temple. And he was able to focus on the measurements because he wasn't doing the building. He would be meticulous knowing he'd be handing these plans to his son. How many of us are careful with the standards that we represent to the next generation? How many of us might be to blame for some of the compromises in the next generation? Because we weren't meticulous with the measurements ourselves. We need to hold high the standard that God has. In humility, not our standard. It's the Lord's standard. I remember one time my son Elijah, the one who's 
doing all this weird political stuff, he told me, he said, Mom, I know why I lose arguments with you. And I said, well, let me, tell me why. He said, because you've been using the scriptures as the standard. So I was really arguing with God over those things. I go, well, there you go. <laughs> and I said, that's true. I go, I go, Elijah, that doesn't change from generation to generation or nation to nation. The word of the Lord endures forever. Moms, be careful with your kids. Make sure they know what our mommy rules and what our God rules. Don't put them at the same level. Mommy rules can change. You know, if you use it, no, you have to put your pillows like this. That is not in like, you know, First Caroline chapter two. This is not, it's just how you want the pillows on the bed. Make sure, I used to tell my kids, this is a mommy rule and you have to obey it. Bible says you have to obey your mother. But when you get older, you can change this rule with your own family. It's just my own rule. My parents had rules and I do it differently than they do. But the things that are written, it is written, it is written, it is written. And it applies to me, it applies to you, to your children, to my great-grandchildren, to my forefathers before me. The word of the Lord endures forever. The plumb line of the Lord is the eyes of the Lord. And it doesn't change based on anything that's not popular or trendy or accepted. Whatever impact we want to have for future generations like David, we have to know it has to be rooted in accurate measurements. For John to measure that temple, it had to match the measurements that were given to David by the Holy Spirit. What we're doing and what we're handing off should agree with Moses, should agree with Solomon, should agree with Jeremiah, should agree with Paul and the Apostle John. It should make it all the way through Genesis to Revelation. When we're measuring things in the Lord, whether they're right or wrong, it should measure as the temple was originally built. It changes not. It's sure and steadfast. His words and standards endure forever, and we must hand the next generation measurements that are written by the Holy Spirit, not the way we think things should be done. Psalm 33, 11 says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Be careful of trends. Be cautious of opinion, even within the church. Some of the things are like obvious, but other things are very subtly introduced into the church. The enemy is likened to a snake. You don't hear a snake walk in. <laughs> That's their advantage. <laughs> Everybody's looking around. No, there's none in here. <laughs> you know, they, they just slither on in, don't they? They're quiet, stealthy. You don't know they're there until you're bit. So be, unless they rattle, the rattle snake, the rattle rat. But be careful, even among your friends, your husbands, things they suggest enter your marriage, things that your kids say, come on, mom, this is cool. Be careful if it's not of the Lord. Don't be arrogant, but be confident. Measure your standards by the plumb line of the Lord. Leave a room if you have to. I've left many rooms of many believers because I just can't go there. Some of them are immature and they're still growing and I didn't feel called to stop it, but I also knew I wasn't so strong to not, I couldn't handle it. You know, I remember in college, there were times I just had to kind of leave my friends sometimes and go, off into my room because I didn't feel God wanted me to correct them. I wasn't strong enough to do that, but I also was too weak. I might be contaminated by what they were doing. So we have to be careful with the plumb line of the Lord. We have to know it's his plans that last forever. Trends come and go. We all remember back in the early 60s, you know, when you know love was whatever love was then and what everybody did. But how many hippies do we have today? You know, living their lives like that. Holy Spirit came in and helped a whole generation of young people who were confused about what love was and thought getting in touch was dropping acid and going somewhere. But God came in, didn't he? I mean, that's amazing how quickly that movement was snuffed and in came the Jesus people movement. And Jesus said, I got to get these kids. They are messed up. You know? He just came in, didn't he? He saw a lot of their little hearts were just confused and he delivered them. And they became the next generation of saying, no, unless a man is born again, he can't get into heaven. And a lot of other people were giving up on the hippies, but God said, no, I can get them. And even now the people we say what love is, love is love. Don't give up on the next generation. A lot of people are just looking for love in the wrong places. We pray for revival among people that are confused because they're confused. 
and they're building their lives not according to the plumb line of the Lord, and it's going to implode, it will not last. And we have to pray for them that the Lord will come, forgive, heal, and rebuild, and they'd be the next generation to stand up and say, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. I believe a lot of times when we see people not building and they fall down, they're the next generation that's going to proclaim who the builder and maker of life is, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the houses that fall down during the tornadoes and things like that that get rebuilt, that stand out among all the other ones. They, they, they stood out because they look horrible, and then all of a sudden they're rebuilt. Like, whoa, look at that porch. You know, like, that looks so pretty. And because it was destroyed, it got rebuilt in a way it would have never been built before. So let's not give up on the next generation. We need to know which ones are truly in the scriptures and which things are unchanging. The temple represents the Lord in the center of his people. And we need to measure what it means to connect and to follow God with his standards. Rise and measure, he was told. We need to be aware of worldly standards, cultural influences, personal preferences. I have those. And I always, sometimes I walk through my house and I go, I'm just so off. I tell the Lord, how do you even put up with me? I go, I have so many personal biases. Oh, I'm going, help me see things like you see them because I know I'm not looking at this right. And I go, and I want to look at it your way. Create me a clean heart, God. Renew a right spirit. Renew my mind, Lord, so I can know your good, perfect, and acceptable will because I have this bent. And I, I know it because it's so, it's so oppressive. And I can tell it's not his because... It doesn't feel good in my spirit, even though it feels familiar to my personality. I go, this is familiar, this isn't holy. Lord, help me change. We need to measure the temple with the heavenly measuring reed. When we're looking for a church to go to, when we're trying to understand what is worship, when we want to connect with God, use the word of God to see these things, not cultural trends either way. I hear Christians have the most interesting criteria for picking churches. My husband's a pastor. We've been in the ministry for 31 years. We have people leave our church and join our church. Someone leaves the same day for the same reason somebody else comes in. <laughs> your church is like this, so I'm leaving. So I go, oh, we're coming to your church because of this. Same reason. You're like, going, what the heck? <laughs> I can't change churches because my husband's a pastor. So I never, I never go through that. I'm the one that has to always go, oh, I don't like that. How do I adjust? Like, I have to mature and adjust to everything. Whether I don't like the way our worship's going, I like our chairs, I air conditioner, I don't know, whatever, you go through dumb things with church. I have to always adjust. I told the Lord, I'm so glad I'm a pastor's wife. I never have to church hunt, ever. I, <laughs> I just know I'm where I'm supposed to be, and it's supposed to change and affect me. But let's be careful, you guys, that when we're even picking churches, you know, let's get on our knees and let's open the book, and let's ask God that we're not being carnally minded and letting the devil so discord. I've seen so many people leave our church that um, people can leave churches. They're supposed to. Jesus moves people around. I have no problem with that. But I've seen people, and recently this happened, uh, especially difficult people. Um, they're difficult. Like they're wounded. They came in. They come to know the Lord, and they're hardly along with because you know God's changing them. So everybody learns about a difficult person. This happened with somebody at our church who was a difficult person. <clears throat> I really love this person. My husband did too, and. Um, and, and, you know, we'd have to keep working through things with the person. But that's what love does, right? Love bears all things, endures all things. Well, that's what love is. That's what family does. And we're family. And um, he left our church. And I thought, well, this is not good because he has to start over now in the next congregation for everybody to find out how difficult he is and then earn, get them to a point where they're comfortable working with difficult people. And I hope he does, because he, he was alone, he was single, and he had some issues. And I know he went to this other church and he didn't connect well. It, he wasn't breaking through that. You know, he actually got born again at our church. And, um, and so there was, you know, just that love you have for somebody seeing them come out of the world. And, um, and he went to this other church and just never made long-term friends. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is so sad for him. Well, last week he died in his bed alone. And we can't even find people that know him to have a funeral to support him. Like he died kind of alone. And I remember thinking, oh, the devil is such an idiot. Well, actually he's very smart. 
But I'm very angry at him because he isolated this guy. And his time was short. It was gonna, and he, he, he shouldn't have ended his life like that. Should have been around people that loved and supported him and had him over for dinner. And I mean, God did do one neat thing in his life with this one family, which was really good. And I appreciate the Lord doing that. But as far as a church family, he had isolated himself. Be careful. Sometimes the enemy <coughs> wants us to leave a church because he really knows that is where we're supposed to grow. And, and it's okay to leave a church, but let's not use um, our own measurement. Let's not be wise in our own eyes. Let's look in the word and make sure we have things. Then the spirit of God giving us the plans that it's time to go or, you know, that can happen. And when people leave because the Lord, it's always so cool because you just multiply Christian friends, huh? I've like got friends that left our church and now I know them and their whole church and it's not weird, it's not icky, it's, it's just, you know, transplanting. We're in a war, God moves his soldiers around. I love all that. But let's not pick churches. Let's not measure the temple by our own standards. And then he goes on and he measures the altar. Let's consider the inner temple, inner part of the altar. It says there, rise and measure the altar. This is the inside. Solomon had to measure the altar. John was to measure the inner altar to make sure it met the measurements God had for it. In 1 Kings 6.20, it says that the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold and overlaid the altar of cedar. So that shows us there was a measurement for the altar. And it says, um, hold on, cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the temple with pure gold. He stretched gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary. He overlaid it with gold. The whole temple he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the temple. Also he overlaid with gold the entire altar that was by the inner sanctuary. So he took such care to something that was inside the temple that the average person didn't see. And the measurements were measurements that God had given, not just length and depth and all that, but how much gold to put on it and how to make it look. And I believe one of the symbols of the altar being measured is the inner part of a man. How we measure the inside of us. How we go into the altar, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And within us, there's that inner part that nobody sees and we don't understand ourselves. <laughs> right? Do you ever like go, oh, and get out and operate? The Bible calls it the hidden man of the heart. Women are distinctly called to tend to the inner person. In 1 Peter 3.3, 3, do not let your adornment be merely outward. Arranging your hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Might I point out to it, it says spirit, not personality. You can be a vivacious person and still obey First Peter 3. This has to do with the inside. Do you know there's very quiet people that do not have very quiet spirits? Oh, they're seething. They're all quiet, but they're not. They don't have a quiet spirit. <laughs> So really, if you guys, I used to read this, they go, oh no, I'm kind of loud. I can never meet you. Know, and then everybody goes, no, it doesn't say quiet personality. It says my spirit should be at rest in the Lord, and full of peace and joy. And I should be not trying to control and manipulative and, you know, agitated and bitter and, you know, those kinds of things. I'm supposed to have a quiet spirit. I'm supposed to say, okay, sure, let's do that. And, yeah, that sounds great. You know, not being loud with your own demands and what you expect to be done. It should be quiet where it's an altar, where it's quiet enough so that you hear God more than you hear yourself. That's the inner man that's quiet. If we're so busy analyzing and figuring out, playing over, meditating on, replaying conversations, we don't have a quiet spirit. Psalm 139.23 says, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. We initiate it. We don't wait for God to do it. We ask him, search me. Check, check me out. See where I'm off. Because you have the plumb line. And you love me. And anything you're going to straighten out in me is so that I'm built to code. Isn't that good to know? When God shows me something, none of us would get mad at an orthodontist who showed us crooked teeth. 
we'd be happy because they found the clinic or or um, uh, an orthopedic surgeon who shows us a break. No, I just don't want to believe there's a break in my femur. Now we want to know if it's broken so they can fix it. And so when the Lord shows us something, it's always out of love and always a desire to fix and to make it what it should be. Welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Embrace the chastisement of the Lord. You wouldn't be legitimate sons if the Lord didn't say, hey, uh, 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 what you doing with that attitude? And then you go, oh, and you go, and they go, okay. And then you work together and you become who he saved you to be. You're not left to be who you were. You get to be who he wants you to be. Hebrews 4.12 clearly says that the word of God is living and it's powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And look what it does. It doesn't even talk about behavior. It says it pierces to the division of soul and spirit, inside. Joints and marrow, inside. Discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart, inside. So it's the word of God working on the inside. Verse 13, and there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I love that, that we have that. You know, the measuring rod of heaven reveals things we'd never see. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, you're well aware of this. The Lord told Samuel, hey, hey, hey don't look at his appearance. Don't look at his physical stature. I, I refused him because the Lord doesn't look at or see like man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord measures us by his standards. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that we be found faithful. But with me, Paul said, it's a very small thing if I should be judged by you or a human court. Basically, what you guys think of me, I'm not really putting a whole lot of weight on it. You might think I'm all great. Remember, Jesus walks in to Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. A couple days later, crucify him. You know, same crowds in Jerusalem. They don't know what they're talking about. He says, in fact, I don't even judge myself. Verse 4. I know of nothing against myself, yet I'm not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. We are open to judgment and the measuring rod of the altar of our hearts. Finally, he's told, measure those who worship there. Measure people by God's standards. Realizing we look on the outward appearance and we're wrong. Like John, we evaluate people based on the rod from heaven. We might measure people with corrupted measurements. We might think that those who are the most popular in the church are really the most spiritual. Maybe not. Any criteria we might have developed for those we think we should respect or be drawn to or emulate, be careful of the criteria. Be careful about who your heroes are. You should have heroes based upon the plumb line of the Lord. Not Christian culture. Not just because your mom and dad like them. Not because all your friends like them. Not because they put their, uh, you're on a hinge dating site and they wrote just the right thing. Or they have a fish on their core or whatever. This guy knows the Greek. I don't know. Just things we have for people. Um, be careful because we don't see as God sees. We need God's measuring rod to measure those who worship there. Matthew 23, 27 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear, appear to other people, beautiful, beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Verse 28. Even so, you also outwardly, you appear righteous to men, but inside, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. People couldn't see it. How many of us have been surprised by someone we had respected in the faith and found that they've been living a hidden lifestyle for many years before that? Now, God is gracious, and he can restore anybody. And I don't want to look down on anybody who falls into sin because the blood of Christ is more strong than the strongest sin ever committed. But I'm talking about us learning how to esteem and look at people, choose friends wisely, and to know how to esteem people according to heaven's rod and not some other kind of measurement we might have. People can appear one way, but other things are happening. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, 20, we are told that there are many members in the body of Christ, but only one body. And the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And this is no much rather those members of the body which seem to be weak are the necessary ones. When we walk into church, it's amazing who the heroes are. We don't always know. I think when we stand before the Lord in that judgment seat, Dave, when we stand there, we're going to find out, like, what? What's Martha doing? What? How come Martha's got, she's going to break her neck. She's got so many crowns going on. What's going on with Martha? Martha, Martha, was, Martha was the janitor at the church. And the Lord goes, oh, she went through and prayed over each seat as she wiped it down. She went into the children's rooms and prayed they'd be set apart for the gospel. She was over here and she gave 10% of everything she made and prayed over it as she put it in. And she, you know, I mean, like, you know, because you don't see a person's prayers. Shouldn't, shouldn't see most of them. I, th I think we're going to be, I think we're going to love it though, because we're going to be in heaven, everything will make sense. We'll go, how did I miss that one? You know what I'm saying? And then this other person with all these books, and they're all everywhere. It's like, okay, go in the back. Go over there. You already got your rewards on earth. Everybody clap for you. You're done. <laughs> I think we're going to be surprised. Really, some members of the church we think are weaker are really the most valuable. That autistic member. Uh, we have a guy at our church, and he's autistic and pretty severe on the spectrum. And, um, you know, he, he knows numbers very well because, you know, when you're autistic, you know numbers very well. So he'll always come up to me. His name's Clayton, and he always go, uh, Maureen, 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 um, you're 50, 57, right? Yes, I'm 57. No, your birthday's on October 16th, October 16th, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He always wants to tell me numbers, and have me say, yes, sir. That's his way of loving him. And one time he came up to me, and he'd never talked about worship songs. It broke my heart in a neat way. He goes, Maureen, 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 Maureen. I go, yes, Clayton. He goes, you know that song? You know that song, Reckless Love? I go, yeah, I do. He goes, he leaves in 99. He leaves the 99. That's what hit him in that song. And I've heard people yell and argue about the word rap with that song. I'm so tired of that debate. He sealed it for me. I said, are you kidding? Clayton, love that he leaves the 99 and come after him. That one line. And he goes, he leaves the 99. And he was like so blessed because numbers spoke to him about God's love and would come after him. I was like, I started crying. I'm like, and Clayton could be that weaker part of the body that is more necessary. Even though Clayton, you know, can't read super well, doesn't communicate well, I don't see as God sees. I'm supposed to measure people by the rod from heaven, not by like, oh, that person smells, or that person this. You know, aren't we just horrible? I, I, I'm horrible. There's things sometimes happen to me, I go, ooh, I don't know how you dwell inside of me, because that's in my heart. And the Lord goes, well, I'm gonna clean that right out of you. I go, well, go right, here you go. Let's get that out of my heart. It's so gross. Even if you don't try to, things come up sometimes, ah. And you can kind of rebuke it, and, but it's in there, and then you know it's gotta be dealt with. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The worshipers that we want to be around are not perfect people. They're those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Even if they're rough around the edges. I always pray that for my husband and myself. Send us people who call on you have a pure heart. I don't care if they're still cussing and they don't have that down yet. Give me somebody, somebody else, oh, you never cuss And they have like an ugly heart. I'm sorry, I'll take all the cuss words and a pure heart and God will work on the cuss words later. I mean, I don't cuss and I don't think you should, but I mean, that's really not the main thing. You know, we got a heart issue here, right? We got a heart issue. I remember one time I was counseling this lady and she just got saved and she came to my church and she was talking to me and and then she told me what she did for a living. I'm not going to tell you what she did for a living. And she, I was like, I wanted my mouth to, you know, you know, drop open. Like, I was like, she does what? And the Lord goes, don't tell her to quit. I go, put, 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 put. I'm not working on that one yet. And I said, oh, okay. So we were just talking. And she kept coming to Bible study and coming to Bible study. And I was praying for her. I said, Lord, please show her this is not a good business for a Christian woman to be in, and I was praying and praying. And one day I came really early to Bible studies. I'd go to a prayer meeting beforehand, and she was there. 
And she goes, you've been praying about my job, huh? And I said, I have. I have been praying about you. And I go, the Lord told me not to tell you. He would, he would tell you. And she goes, I quit. I quit. And I threw everything away. And I was like, oh. And that was a girl with a pure heart. If I would have worked on behavior rather than the heart, I would have been getting ahead of what the Lord wanted to do. You know, if somebody tries to heal a wound, but then surgery needs to be done first, you could keep infection in there. It's not going to heal right. So it's the heart, 2 Timothy 2. And who knows who has a pure heart? God. That's why we ask him to send people with a pure heart. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Ladies, there's going to be imposters in the church. Some are just deceived. They've been taught incorrectly. And other people are intentionally deceiving. How do we know the difference? The rod of heaven. We have to ask God to show us. Psalm 37, 37 says, Mark the blameless man. Observe the upright. The future of that man is peace. Let's evaluate people that we can respect and ask God to spotlight those people you're supposed to admire. Romans 16, 17 says, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Avoid them. Doesn't say yell at them. Doesn't say post about them on Facebook. It says avoid them. There are people in the church that want to cause divisions. They want to gossip about everybody from the pastor on down to, I don't like the toilet paper in the bathrooms. They just, you know, just avoid them. Maybe they'll mature, pray for them. Because they know the Lord, that'll fix it. But avoid people who want to argue about doctrines and, and argue about everything. We, like John, are asked to rise up in measures of temple, the altar, and the worshipers there so that we have our lives and our little worlds defined by the rod of heaven. Lord, thank you, God. I just ask that you give us wisdom when we measure the temple, the altar, and the worshipers there. Help us to not trust our own judgment, but Lord, give us the rod of heaven. Show us what to value. Show us who to admire. Show us who we're supposed to hang out with. Show us how we're supposed to pick a church. Show us the inward man and what we need help with and affirmation with. Lord, keep us close to the rod from heaven and help us not be wise in our own eyes. In Jesus' name.